You're listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bit and proposal professionals. My name is Vasco Sundram and with my co-host Ashley Case, we will be sitting down with the industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career, and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Catherine Bakina. With 10 years of experience, Catherine brings a unique background in event planning and strategic proposal and marketing management in architecture, engineering, and construction industry. She collaborates with sales team to pre-position for multi-million dollar business opportunities, develop compliant and responsive proposals, and create compelling content for shortlist interviews. This experience includes managing the proposal process, writing and co-authoring technical content, and designing the proposal response in Adobe InDesign. She leads and coaches capture teams in shortlist strategy sessions, interview preparation, presentation development for client facing and industry focused events. Catherine continues to seek opportunities for professional growth and development. She looks to professional associations like the APMP to connect and engage with other professionals in the industry. Starting in 2017, Catherine participated in the mentorship program and served on the marketing committee for the greater Midwest chapter. In 2019, she expanded her involvement in the chapter and served as the publications chair as she collaborated with other board and chapter members to develop quarterly newsletters that engage more than 730 readers. Currently, Catherine is serving as a vice chair for Great Midwest Chapter, and she will serve as the chapter's president in 2022. Welcome, Catherine, to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thank you. That bio makes me sound really professional and really cool. And was it? So let's start from the very beginning, Catherine. Where were you born? And let's talk about your high school and education. Yeah, um, I was actually born in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, born and raised in the area. So I haven't I haven't left. I haven't moved or lived anywhere else. I've really been here in my hometown. So love it and didn't really see a, a reason to leave yet. Who knows? We'll see what uh, unfolds with my career. That's brilliant. Working in your hometown is a blessing. Um, but uh, at what point... Uh, um, I mean, like, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about your early education. So you did your university, schools, high schools, everything in the area, is it? I did, yes. I went to high school. Um, it's in the suburbs, but it's uh, at least some at West High School. So mm-hmm. I graduated there. Um, and then I did my associates at Longview Community College. So we had this program during high school and um, you had to do some volunteer hours and mentoring. And if you met all of the criteria, you were able to get two free years at a community college. So I got my associates and then I transferred that over to UMKC, which is University of Missouri, Kansas City. And I, um, you know, I was kind of a different path. I, I commuted, I didn't stay on campus. Um, and then I worked during the entire time. Um, at the, at the time, my whole goal was just to get through college. I I just wanted to get working and making money. I didn't want to (laughs) be in school. I think in hindsight, I wish I would have slowed down a little bit and maybe enjoyed some of that experience. But, um, yeah, that, that's kind of my path in the education field. Got it, got it. So your first paid job was it during university or before university? And uh, uh, what are the jobs that you took before you entered the professional world? Yeah, I so I started working when I was 13 or 14. Mm. Um, I did a lot of babysitting and nannying with kids and I loved it. You know, it's really fun job great time to go to the pool during the summer and get paid for doing it. So (laughs) I did that. And then um, starting in high school, my junior year, I started to work at a grocery store in the area called Hy-Vee. So I started out as a bagger. So I would bag all the groceries and get carts. And then I just worked in different departments and um, eventually got into event planning and catering through the company. So I did that all through college. Uh, got to attend a lot of really cool weddings. And I thought at that point that I wanted to do event management for a career. So during college, you know, working events and weddings. And then when I graduated, I was full-time there doing weddings and event coordinating. So I had a blast, um, but it quickly wears you down. It's a lot of hard work. 
And I was really missing the weekends and I was missing out on a lot of family and friend time. So I decided I got to do something different. And that's kind of how I ended up on the proposal side. Wow. Was it a straightforward uh, application that you need to apply to get to a role or was it word of mouth? How did you enter the proposal? You know, um, I feel like everybody answers this question with the, the same answer and it's totally by accident. I had no idea what proposals were. I didn't realize it was a career path um, or an actual industry. I was completely clueless. Um, I started researching when I was doing the event planning and I knew I wanted to do something else. I started by researching different companies. You know, where do I want to land? What's a good company to be at? Get my foot in the door and figure out what I want to do because I had no idea. I was kind of lost at that point. So luckily, um, I found Burns McDonald, which is where I'm at right now. And I applied. I have to be honest. I applied multiple times, never got an interview. And then I knew someone who worked there and she said, hey, I know you're looking. And I found a job that I think you'll be good at. Just give it a chance. I want you to interview. I know who your boss would be. Um, I think you'd be a great fit. So I applied. The role was proposal assistant. And I saw the job description. I was like, okay, well, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm going to apply. She encouraged me to do it. Uh, I had a great interview and they saw something in me and hired me. So in that role, I was responsible for printing all of the proposals in the greater Kansas City area and also supporting some of our regional offices with printing their proposals, um, other marketing collateral that we used to print and have on hand all the time. So that was really my role. And that's how I started. Wow, it's a nice blend of application and referral. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, so how long have you been with Burns McDonald now and how is the journey so far? You know, it's been great. Um, I've been with the company for seven years mm. and I know, I know, I still can't believe that. Um, you know, I really started out at the bottom, uh, printing proposals, not knowing anything about them. And I was very fortunate to have uh, some great mentors in my life that showed me what this career could do and what the possibilities were. So Kristen Maycomber actually, who um, is our president for APMP currently. So she was hired on um, at the firm to kind of help us revamp our pursuit strategy process. And she saw something in me and said, hey, I know you don't know what you wanna do, but I think you've got skills. And if you stick with me, you're gonna go far. And so I completely trusted her because I was just in awe with her capability um, of leading groups and just, I mean, her work ethic, everything. And so I really just followed and, and um, took advantage of that and learned from her and other people in the company um, on, about proposals. So, you know, I went from printing the proposals to helping uh, review cover letters and executive summaries, uh, project manage. Uh, graphics and some other deliverables for other folks in the company who needed extra support on proposals. And then eventually I came over um, to our water global practice, which is just our like water market and joined the team there and started leading proposals on my own. And then now um, I'm the proposal manager for the water practice and uh, manage three other people in our group. So it very, very much started from the bottom. Now we're here, Drake style. That's That's been my career path. That's nice, Catherine. So Catherine, what was your very first proposal? Do you have any early memories of that? or And also any other memorable proposals comes to your mind you can share? Oh, man. You know, I think if you ask any proposal professional, they always have specific stories of good and bad. Um, you know, I remember the first wins and being a part of that and getting hooked and realizing, okay, I like this. I like being part of a team. I like helping craft the message and, you know, the graphics and the visual to support and deliver a compliant and responsive winning proposal. That's always a good thing. Um, but you know what, the ones where you make a mistake or the big losses, those are the ones that you remember 
too, or at least I do, because I feel like in each of those, I've been able to take something from that and apply it to the next one, you know, learning from those failures and those losses and figuring out how to capitalize or, or change the approach to get better and win the next one. That's a nice one, Catherine, well said that one. So at what point in your career did you come across APMP as an industry bully? Um, when I started out as proposal assistant, I was in that role for about four months before Kristen uh, came on board. And it was there that she started to introduce me into different fields of the industry, you know, the proposal industry. And she said, hey, you should join APMP. It's a great organization. There's lots to learn. And, um, you know, she put it well. It's, it's a group of our people. They get what w- that we do and they understand our trials and tribulations. And so I would say it was about 2015 that I joined APMP and, and started out just really honing in on all of those webinars. I learned so much during that time. Um, really listening into other uh, folks in the industry and and learning from them. So that that was uh, my real involvement before I started to be more of an active em- member and get to be part of the chapter here in the greater Midwest. Perfect. I think joining APMP as a member is one, Catherine, but then going ahead and uh, making active contribution in chapter volunteering, it's a different one. Um, talk us through your journey of uh, Greater Midwest Chapter when you joined 2017 and your mentorship program and marketing initiatives and so on and so on, and all the way to becoming vice chair and next year chapter president. Oh, man, this is going to be, I'm, I'll keep this brief for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I started on the marketing uh, committee. Uh, just kind of getting my feet wet and trying to understand how uh, the chapter board is set up and organized and start contributing to an organization that's given me so much. So I started there, helped out a little bit on the newsletter, um, some other initiatives for the symposium that we do every year. And then um, someone approached me because we had a a chapter member who just couldn't take on the newsletter anymore. Um, She was having a lot of work at her day job, you know, which this is all volunteer. So she had a lot on her plate. And so I stepped up to help her out with that. And then um, from there, I took over and did the newsletter or the publications chair for a few years. Um, And then they approached me last year about being vice chair. And I was I was very shocked because, you know, I look at that role and I'm like, man, that's the big leagues. That's the big time. And maybe in five years, I'll get to that point. So um, other, other members saw that in me and said, Hey, we, we think you'd be a great fit. So I was extremely flattered and humbled. um, And so far I have learned a ton. There's a lot that goes on in the background um, and, you know, great learning opportunity, really develop some strong relationships with other board members. And, you know, I've had a great time. And as always, your, your whole goal is to make sure you're supporting the chapter and the members and reaching them um, because they, there's a lot of people out there who rely on these groups to have that connectivity and learning opportunity. And I think the greater Midwest chapter, we've been doing a lot of cool stuff and we've got a lot of great board members Um, committee members who have given a lot back to the proposal industry. So I'm really proud to be a part of that and a little scared for next year. I'll admit that I'm a little scared since it's my name at the, at the top there, but I'm confident because there's a lot of people in our chapter who I know I can lean on for support and uh, who can also take us to the next step. So really exciting stuff. And it wasn't Catherine, you'll be a star, definitely. So, uh, <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> um, looking back at the GMC Midwest chapter, I mean, like, uh, um, would any shout outs or anything that you could say in the past one year during this COVID crisis and this uh, sub- support that our chapter gave to our members? Absolutely. Um, you know, I 
I don't want to leave anybody's names out, but I know Heather Finch and Stacey Dewey were really involved in um, some giving back initiatives. And so they started to lead um, this. Uh, so first of all, a stipend, because as you know, a lot of people have lost their jobs or transitioning during this time. So we didn't want those members to have to sacrifice their membership to the greater Midwest chapter because it is such a resource um, and it's a network to connect and find new uh, opportunities. So we uh, created this stipend program where you just need to apply and, and, you know, give us the reason why you need support with that membership and then we honor it. So I thought that was really awesome. Great idea from the team who put that together. And then there was another really cool idea, which was to offer resume reviews. And that's for people looking for jobs that's in the proposal industry that's for other people outside of the proposal industry looking for new opportunities who needed to sharpen up their resumes and you know that's something we do all the time in this industry and in this field so offering that up as you know a free opportunity i thought was really cool um, such a great idea and such an awesome way to give back beyond the proposal industry. So I think those are the top two really great things that kind of stemmed from the pandemic that I, I thought the chapter went above and beyond in coming up with that. So kudos to all those people who are involved in that. I know there is a lot. Definitely, Catherine, definitely. It's only in the testing times we realize who stood up and worked for the community and who are being floating naked yeah. so far. Yeah, That's exactly. Good. That's, good. That's nice. That's nice. So um, have you attended any big conferences? Do you have any memorable Bitcoin? Yes. Um, so, you know, my very first one, I believe that was um, New Orleans. <clears throat> yes, it was New Orleans. And I remember getting there and thinking, holy cow, this is a lot of people. And this is the big time. I had no idea how massive APMP was until I attended that conference. Um, and, you know, I tell everybody who hasn't, I always tell them, find a way to attend at least one because it's amazing how many people are there, how many people who, you know, face the same struggles that you do. And like I said, it's, it's, these are our people. These are the people who understand what we do day to day. Um, so that one was memorable as well, because I was um, trying to get my foundation certification and it was up that, that would have been um, the caveat to me pending through my company was to get my certification and then I could attend. So I, I signed up and I've registered and I scheduled the conference room to take my exam and I was ready. I was pumped. I get in there and the code that I received wasn't right. So I started to panic and I'm like, oh my gosh, did I mess this up? And you know, the, the testing is based out of the UK. So we're like opposite time zones here, you know, from the Midwest and the United States. So I um, was in this emailing back and forth of, hey, this isn't working. Okay, try this, try that. So it was just days leading up to it. And then finally, you know, we got something to work, but I was able to take it in the hotel room in New Orleans, um, after my flight, I had a MiFi hotspot. I had everything ready to go. And then outside of my hotel room, they do like all of those river bo riverboat, um, you know, dinners and everything else. And it was the most amazing feeling ever. Went downstairs and what a way to celebrate because I had, uh, you know, Kristen was there and uh, other people I've met through the chapter were there and, and we all got together and celebrated. So that was my first BidCon and it was super memorable and, um, you know, just had a blast. It was great. Wow, that's really memorable, Catherine. So that's, uh, that's the professional part of Catherine. So let's just go ahead and talk a little bit more about the personal Catherine. So tell us three things not many people know about you, Catherine. This is so hard. I, I always struggle with these questions. Um, I, I'll say that one thing, um, when I was in high school, I was on drumline and I played percussion. So a lot of people don't know that about me. Um, so I was, you know, wearing one of those drums and out there on the field doing like the marching and stuff. I did that. 
and then uh, played percussion on the off season of, of, uh, of marching band. So did that all through high school. And I was uh, one of the section leaders for drumline. So that was pretty comical to see a four foot 11 um, young woman boss around a bunch of five foot plus six foot plus young men on the field. Um, So that's one thing for sure that people don't know about me. Um, Gosh, I don't know if I can come up with two others. I feel like I'm pretty much an open book. (laughs) <laughs> no because most listeners don't know you Catherine so maybe something that's true that's true <laughs> um you know what okay so I really enjoy podcasts mm. and I'm kind of a true crime nut and I know that sounds really weird but um I am a as you say a murderino so for those of you who listen to my favorite murder you know exactly what that means um stay sexy don't get murdered uh, great podcast, really fun <laughs> listen, um, but also, you know, you you pick up a few things, a little bit of self awareness. Um, Crime Junkie, I love that one as well. And then there's several uh, series through the Australian uh, that I really enjoy as well, like Dirty John and um, Who the Hell Is Hamish. That one's not really murder focused, but those are those are good ones. And Teacher's Pet. How could I forget? Teacher's Pet. That's a good one. So podcasts, love them. God, a crime podcast. I think one of my friends is also a very biggie like you on this. Uh-huh. And I think I remember she was telling me a few things. It's like my favorite murder mm-hmm. and uh, uncover, I think. There's something. And okay. uh, welcome to Case File, the true crime podcast. Yeah. Or something. Uh, so, yeah. So, I know. I mean, Anytime like, I... Anytime I say my favorite murder, people are like, oh, yikes, you're crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I promise I'm not. (laughs) I know. My wife would love you. That's exactly what she listens and watches pretty much (laughs) 24-7, I think. Whenever I go, there is always something that's going on. That's like somebody solving about a mystery. I mean, like, Yeah, you can't look away. You can't look away. (laughs) That's good. That's good, Catherine. That's good. Any hobbies and interests other than um, listening to podcasts, Catherine? Yeah, um, you know, I during the pandemic, um, my husband's an avid biker, and I always said, yeah, I need to go with you, and I just never really bought a bike, and so during the pandemic, it was perfect time, so bought a bike, um, and we hit up some trails. I think we're going to go this weekend. Um, I am not I am not professional by any means. This is just like really low key, have fun, but I really enjoy it. It's nice to get out and and do some physical activity. Uh, We also do some hiking and camping. We're trying to spend more time outdoors, especially since the year that should not be named. Uh, We were indoors a lot, especially during the winter. So um, yeah, those are some of my hobbies. And uh, believe it or not, even at four foot 11, I play sand volleyball uh, at a local place here in Kansas City. And I absolutely love it. I never really did sports growing up. I was always that nerdy kid who did theater and singing and music. And I never got into any sports. And it wasn't until about college that we started playing and, and I love it so much. It's fun. And I like winning, which is probably why I'm, I'm involved in proposals. <laughs> That's a good one, Catherine. I think while we were talking about it, I was just visualizing if you and Christine stands next to each other. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, that's like my whole life though, but yes, yes. I, I have a new um, professional on my team and she is 5'11". So I, we, I hired her during the pandemic. I had no idea how tall she was. We met up in the office one day and, and she's walking down the hall towards me and I'm like, oh, she's a little bit taller than I thought she'd be. And she keeps getting closer and I'm like, oh my God, I'm... <laughs> I'm a shrimp. So we always, uh, we always make jokes, but you know, I'm used so, to it. So I'm, I'm yeah. like, yes, I totally agree on that, Catherine. I think we normally see people on the top off, right? Do all the Microsoft Teams calls, the Zoom calls, et cetera. Yes. When you physically yeah. meet them, then it's like, oh, you are taller, you're different. You know, you are not the same person. Yeah. You, you, Because we have this mental image of this person. And then when the person physically comes and see you, well, you're like, I know you, but I really don't know you. It's just a yes. <laughs> I feel like 
like maybe I should take that as a compliment though, because I do get that effect a lot where I meet someone in person after, you know, collaborating on a proposal virtually the whole time we meet in person. And that's like the first thing they say, they're like, wow, you're a lot shorter than I thought you'd be. And so (laughs) I don't know if that's like a, a testament to my personality or capability. Maybe it's a stretch, but I'm going to go with that. They're just so impressed with me that they're shocked. I'm not, you know, super tall and powerful. <laughs> I did. Height doesn't matter. As you can see, some of the strongest people in the world, some of the strongest leaders have all been under five feet, you know, from That's the likes right. of, you know, so, you know it, it just, it's just a fun conversation. Don't worry. I mean, like, yeah. it's a, uh, I mean, like people find every reason to uh, to kind of debunk, um, you know, you are, it could be physics or it could be yeah. sex or it could be diversity. It could be so many things where Catherine, when yeah. you stay strong and continue to inspire, you know, that's the main thing. That's so, right. I knew I liked you, Baskar. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Catherine. So now we are officially entering the rapid random fire question round or oh what we call the nutters round in honor of Howard Not. So, Question number one. There is no right or wrong answer. Uh, just whatever comes in your mind, spontaneous, let just go. What's the best and worst purchases you have made so far? Oh, man. That is a really good question. I'm sure on any other day, I could come up with like a really good answer. Oh, okay. This is going to sound really, really like girly and silly, but I'd say the best purchase I've made. Um, okay. So I'm sure other people have experienced this. I, I hope I'm not alone anyways, but I don't tend to buy a lot of stuff, but during the pandemic, I totally, you know, the digital ads on social media got to me and I started buying stuff that I was like, Oh yeah, that's kind of cool where maybe I didn't really need to buy it. Um, but the best purchase that I made is it's this, um, dryer and you plug it in, but it's like a a rolling brush as well. And so you just kind of brush your hair through and it dries your hair and it sounds so silly, but it's been a game changer for me because I don't have to like dry my hair and then straighten it. I just do one thing. My hair is healthier. It's fantastic. So I'd say that's like the best purchase I've made so far. I'm, I'm very happy with it. That's very good, Catherine. I mean, like, uh, you are happy. I can see that from your... <laughs> uh, we can listen through it. And the worst purchase? I mean, like, that could be many. I mean, like, like you, I'm very spontaneous. I click and buy, then I realize why am I... Why am I bought mm-hmm. it? There could be many, but anything comes to mind? Yeah, you know, again, this is going to sound terrible, but um, I purchased this exercise like package where it's bar class. Um, And so you learn like some Pilates and like ballet bar exercises. So they had this deal going on and it was during quarantine. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And it, okay, don't get me wrong. It was great. And I did enjoy it for a little bit, but I felt like it put way too much stress on me because I was not good at it at all. And I was so, I would get so frustrated in the middle of the workout, you know, the instructors telling you to like tuck and hold and do all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm an idiot. I cannot get my body to move in the time you need me to. And I'm sure if I would have stuck with it a little longer, it would have been great. But, um, you know, exercise is supposed to be like stress-free and put you in a better mood. And I would leave class being like, God, I sucked so bad during that class. So I think that's probably the worst purchase (laughs) I've made recently. Like worst bad or worst and good. I don't know. It was bad for me. Uh, That's brilliant. Thank you, Cassie. (laughs) So so, uh, can you remember any incident where you literally kind of messed it up, but no one ever found it was you? (gasps) Oh, man. I would say yes and no, Um, because someone did, someone did figure it out, but I thought I was being real slick. So (laughs) (laughs) 
we had these training books um, and this is a, a Kristen story. So when she was hired on, she totally revamped our pursuit strategy um, at our company. And as part of that, it was this whole sales training rollout. And so she'd go from office to office and part of my job was to put these books together and it's these binder books and it was, you know, the slides and then some other documents and worksheets, everything they needed to have during this two plus hour uh, training. So it was a lot. And that was for the entire company. And I was the only one doing it. And at that time we had tabs, but they were custom tabs. So for those of you who don't know, I would have to print the tabs on larger paper, trim them all down, and then I had to hand cut with a little machine each tab divider, which takes a very long time. And I got really good at it, you know, so you have to put it in the thing, you, you punch it down, you flip the page over, and then you punch it again. But you have to make sure that you measure it at the same at the right length to get the specific tab extension. So like whether it's the first, second or third tab. So I was doing all of those and I was I got done. It was my last one before I had to uh, leave for the day and I did it and I accidentally chopped it off. And I was like, oh, my God, it's going to be such a pain in the butt to go back to my desk, print that one page, trim it down and then hand cut that tab again. And I thought, what are the odds? No one's going to know, you know, that TikTok, no one's going to (laughs) know. So I (laughs) I taped the tab extension back on with like clear tape. I was like, oh yeah, no one's going to know. Well, someone did find out later and it was Kristen. She came back and she was like, what is this? I was like, what do you mean? (laughs) She said, "Did did you tape this tab extension on? And I thought to myself, what are the odds? It's the one book. Like, how did she get that one out of 50 and found this taped tab at the very end of this book? And, you know, we laughed about it, obviously, but it was a good learning experience, especially in proposals is that, you know, fix it. Someone always notices. So fix it if you see it before it goes to a client. Um, So a funny story, but uh, yeah, definitely learning experience. No, I mean, like, that's that's a basic. I think not many people can be honest on this question. Obviously, everybody learns, everybody does learnings, you know, I won't even call it mistakes, but uh, yeah, it's like, you know, you know, when you work long and late at some point, you know, I always say good enough is better than being perfect. And, uh, you know, everybody try for perfection, but I'm like, you know, at some point, 80%, you know, it's good enough, you know, move mm-hmm. on, you know, you can't try for perfection and everything in life. But, you know, I, I would true. have done pretty much the same in uh, what you just said now, Catherine, <laughs> but that's good. But obviously, I didn't have the Christine as my boss, so I escaped so far, since it's my own company. It's the same thing. <laughs> but uh, one day, one day, yes, that's quite nice. So I know you, you were also um, into leadership, uh, reading and other things. So what quote or saying mm-hmm. Um, you really like from the leadership arena? Oh, wow. You know, I've really been into Brene Brown recently, and she has a great book called Dare to Lead. And then there's also a podcast that she's been hosting uh, with several other leaders in her network. And there are so many good nuggets out of those podcasts in her book that I just have to stop and pause and go, wow, that's powerful and, and write them down. And I think for me, you know, this is really my first year being a manager of people. And I struggled with that a lot because maybe it's the perfectionist in me. I want to be perfect at everything. And when you're a, a manager of people and of proposals, you can't be perfect at everything and you have to learn to let go. And she said something on the podcast, um, or actually it was one of her guests and her guest said, you know, you don't have to have all the answers, ask your people because they likely do. And I know it sounds so simple, but that was really an eye opener for me because it took the pressure and the stress off of my shoulders of feeling like I have to have all the answers because I'm a manager. I have to know everything because I'm a manager. I have to be the best because I'm a manager. Now, of course, I put all of that on myself and, you know, I'm obviously aware of it, but hearing that really 
just reiterated that it's okay. That's why we have a team. And it's far more powerful when you engage your team for those answers, because then everybody has that you know, autonomy and they feel like their voice is heard. So I think recently that's the biggest leadership moment that it was kind of my aha. Totally, Catherine, you nailed it there. I mean, like showing vulnerability is the greatest part of leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, like it's all old style. You know, we watch all these 1980s, 1990s (laughs) movies, firm shouting at people, et cetera. But now people know it's the human everybody's human and what nobody knows all the answers nobody also is good at everything right it's showing that vulnerability hey you know what it's trust and things but Mm -hmm. you know what you will be you'll you'll be progressing more and more you know because first of all it's accepting the fact that this is happening most people kind of you know wishy-washy and they just go with that that's good one so if you are given a one minute ad slot during the super bowl that uh you can use it to sell anything. What would you fill it with? Oh, I could sell anything? Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. Call this a miscongeniality moment. <laughs> 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 so if you, if you know the movie reference, um, you know, they always make the joke when they answer at the pageant, world peace. And it sounds so stupid. Um, but, you know, the more and more, especially externally what's happening in our world and and I just wish people could be more kind to each other I think that's the one big thing I would sell is just be nice give each other some grace and some kindness and and have true conversations and try to understand each other I think that's that's one thing I would sell on a serious note obviously that's good that's a good one on a funny note, I would say I would I would sell like, hey, you need to give me all your money so I can just go travel the world. That's what I would sell. But on a serious note, <laughs> be kind my, to each other. This is my account details and you have 30 seconds to put <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Yeah, totally. That's a good one. And the clock ticks and the counter opens. It's like $1 million. Yay. Exactly. Million. <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> It's good. So what's the best Wi-Fi name you have ever seen or ever been used? Oh, Wi-Fi. Okay. Well, I have one, but it is not safe for work. Mm. So I'm not going to say it. Um, But I do get a kick out of the nerdy ones where like somebody called it the Shire like from Lord of the Rings. I was like, oh, uh-huh. that's cute. That's funny. Um, but there's definitely some really inappropriate uh, funny ones that I, I will not say on this podcast. <laughs> that's good. That's good. So what are some things, according to you, that are okay to do occasionally, but not okay to do every day? Mm. Well, if I could tell my quarantine self, it would be, It's okay to have a cherry limeade from Sonic occasionally, but it's not okay every day to have a cherry limeade from Sonic. Uh, In the words of Donna from uh, Parks and Rec, treat yourself, but try not to treat yourself every single day. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So what is the most ridiculous fact you know? What's the most what? the ridiculous fact, any fact that you know that's like, this is absolutely ridiculous, yeah. Oh, um, oh gosh, I don't even know. I don't know if I know any facts. No? No, I can't, I honestly can't think of anything. I'm sure later when I listen to this, I'll be like, oh, you should have said this. (laughs) (laughs) That's what's gonna happen. (laughs) Yeah, and I think, uh, because I have this book of 1000, fun facts mm-hmm. or something and because I have two boys 10 and 8 you know we obviously I need to look cool right so I just, oh yeah I just, I just read in parallel and go and show off to them but one of the things which I found yesterday was supposedly strawberries has more vitamin c than orange <laughs> really <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah there are so, so, so many things in, and it's little bites like this and um, Beethoven you know the musician Beethoven yeah. Um, before he composes music, he normally pours he normally pours cold water on himself. <laughs> oh, okay. 
yeah and there and, I guess and, it livens you up wakes you up a little bit exactly and it continues as it is with the way I just answered <laughs> your question there but it's okay so if you could eat only three foods for the rest of your life which three food would you eat every day mm. I love hot wings yeah. so chicken hot wings love them I could eat them all the time um when I am feeling stressed, <laughs> my go-to is a Reuben sandwich. I feel like I'm a Reuben connoisseur these days because I'm always in the search of like the perfect Reuben sandwich. Um, there's a place in Kansas City called Grinders, and I feel like they so far have had the best Reuben sandwich that I've eaten. Um, I, I know there's probably others out there, so please feel free if anyone's listening to this to tell me where the best Reuben sandwich is and I'll go eat it. Um, and then I think my third favorite is actually watermelon. Mm -hmm. I love this time of year when the watermelon are just so sweet. I, I could sit down and honestly eat an entire watermelon by myself probably every day if I could. This is the most unique. <laughs> I know. Hot wings, Reuben sandwiches, got to throw a little health in there. So we'll go with the watermelon. <laughs> I should have said chocolate, but you know, no, we'll go healthy. Watermelon. <laughs> that's, that's really good. That's nice. So what trait do you like the most about yourself? Wow. You're just really, you're like Oprah right now. You're asking the tough <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that I am a empathetic person. Mm. I, I've taken some personality traits and leadership trait quizzes, you know, all of those. And, and that's kind of the common denominator is that I am empathetic. So I, I'm good at listening and understanding where people may feel disconnected or understanding and relating to them and, and hearing out their feelings. So that also can mean it's very hard to make decisions sometimes because uh, mm. I see both sides of the coin. So it has its its bonuses and its pitfalls. But I think most people would say that about me is that I'm empathetic. That's nice. I think being an empathetic leader is is amazing. That's good. So uh, I think that's kind of ends our rapid random questions round obviously i had few but uh, mm -hmm. we will we can always come back for a part two very soon okay. friend, so don't worry <laughs> so who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career oh man um <clears throat> you know i'll say my parents have been very influential um they've always supported me in everything that I do. And, you know, I, I think my dad, as much as it annoyed me when I was younger, he would always have these little nuggets of like, uh, you know, wisdom or things that you should do. And I always used to kind of roll my eyes. Like the number one thing he always used to say was to me, at least <laughs> he used to say, um, you know, if you put your name on something, make sure that you want, or you're, you're good with it that if somebody else picks it up and sees your name on it, that you're proud of that. And, you know, being in third grade, I was like, okay, whatever, dad, I just want to go play outside. Um, but now it definitely resonates with me. Um, you know, being proud of what my personal brand is and what I put out there, that's a big deal. And I think that's especially relevant here with social media and the, the world we live in is just be proud of the things that are out there and, and what I associate myself with. So I'd say my parents, very influential in my life, but little nuggets of wisdom like that from my father have, have really gone a long way. That's great. That's great, Catherine. Um, yeah. So who is the kindest person you know? Oh boy. The kindest person, you know, I had some time to really think about this. And I have to say, I, I'm so lucky to be surrounded by some really awesome people. Um, there's a lot of family and, and uh, you know, like your chosen family. So you're not related, but you choose them as your people. And I feel like they've really 
shown me kindness in different ways and supported me in different ways. But I have to say that I think my mother-in-law is truly one of the kindest people I have ever met. She is one of those people who will have nothing and then give you whatever she can muster up or find something for you. She's a very selfless person. And I really admire that about her. Um, I, I know that's, that's hard, especially when she works so many hours. She's such a hard worker and I respect her so much, but she will give everything to other people and, and just have compassion and kindness when, you know, maybe it's hard to find that. So I would, I would say my mother-in-law. God, Catherine, <laughs> we have done 120 episodes, Catherine, but nobody ever sees you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And if my mom listens to this, she's gonna be like, well, you don't think I'm kind? <laughs> Or your I'm in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you know what? You have scored the basic point here. I'm sure it's going to make you people happy, including your husband, which is great. I hope um, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's nice. So uh, what have you observed lately in this COVID environment that reminded you that people are kind? I started when we first got sent home and it was like March and I started to take walks over the the lunch break. And I noticed in my neighborhood that there were lots of sidewalk chalk signs and it said, you know, you're doing great. Keep going. You've got this. And I thought that, you know, especially during that time, it was, it was pretty emotional and not everyone knew how to navigate. So seeing those signs on the sidewalk were just, it was nice. It brought a little tear to my eye. Um, and then people in our neighborhood chat who would offer supplies or support, like, you know, Hey, I've got some extra canned good items. They're going to be on my porch. Feel free to stop by. Don't ring the doorbell. Just come get it you know, completely anonymous and sharing that support and providing support throughout the neighborhood. I, I just loved seeing that and those other random acts of kindness that it doesn't take much, especially when it's anonymous, you know, someone's not doing it to look for uh, recognition or someone's not doing it on a TikTok or an Instagram story to gain followers. They're just doing it because they're good people and they care. So I would, I, I think that's, there's several of those instances that I've seen during this time that really make me believe in the good in people. Wow, well said, Catherine, well said. So, Catherine, you have been in the industry for close to 10 plus years, no, Catherine? There is certain perception of this is what the industry is and this is not what the industry is, etc. And you might have seen what's happening in the past 24 hours as well. Oh, boy. So uh, what is that one common myth about our profession that you want to debunk? I would say, which I think I've, I've done my best to make sure I don't fall into this trap, but you know, our role as proposal, proposal professionals, we're not meant to just pretty things up. I always hate that term, you know, and I know sometimes people say it and they mean well, but that's not our job is to pretty things up. Our job is to provide strategic planning and writing and content, graphics, you name it. We're part of that team. We're part of selling and winning business. And I think that's definitely something a lot of people have worked hard to debunk because I I know when I started here, you know, at Burns and McDonald, the role was called marketing coordinator, but honestly, what you did is you cleaned up word documents, you did a word search, you maybe added a few graphics, that was it, you know, and taking that and turning it to, Hey, you're a proposal manager, you're a proposal strategist, and you're part of that strategy. You're helping on the pre-positioning, the capture planning, you're writing wind themes, you're helping us be more strategic, compliant, responsive to our clients. That's big. You know, we're more than just editing or we're more than just prettying it up. I think that's the biggest thing I want to debunk with this profession. That's a good one. A good powerful one, Patrick. Thank you. Catherine, what's that one thing you wish you had known when you started in this career? I think I can probably give you two solid answers. Um, One, I will say 
I wish that I would have taken more writing courses and uh, worked more on my persuasive writing. I feel like it's taken me a bit to get to that point. And I wish I would have paid more attention or at least had a track in college, you know, university where I could learn more about this profession. So I think that's one of them. And the second one is a little fluffier and that's to cut yourself some slack. Um, I've been told by several people that I can be too hard on myself and I feel like that's true and I'm starting to realize it and you can't be perfect. You even said it earlier, you can't be perfect all the time. You know, you can try your best and that matters. So I think uh, telling my younger self to just, Hey, cut yourself some slack. You're doing all right. And you're learning. You're not going to be perfect right out the gate and that's okay. The important thing is to learn from it and just continue to grow your skills. Well done, Catherine, totally. So in addition to that, is there any other best piece of advice you have received that you would like to share to the listeners? Um, I would say, you know, gosh, I'm just a, a fountain of wisdom, Bhaskar. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll narrow it down. No, I, <laughs> I, I think uh, the power of people is really important and no one really prepared me in this role and in a career and navigating corporate life in general, that there are a lot of different personalities that you have to manage and collaborate with. And I, you know, we joke, especially in the proposal industry, that part of our role is therapist. And sometimes that's true. And I think uh, just taking a moment to listen to people, just hear them, and feel like, give them a platform to be heard. I think that's what a lot of people just want at the end of the day. And sometimes, you know, I learned early on that I have to put my ego aside and figure out how I have to change what I'm doing to get the best product out of somebody else. Now, do I think that's right? No, but do I get results? Yes. So if I can be flexible and figure out how I approach things a little differently to get a better product out of somebody, um, then I will. So I I think being flexible and learning how to work with people, but also not sacrificing your brand or your pride um, is really important. Totally, totally, Catherine. Catherine, we talked about your early life, career, um, APMP, a few fun questions, and, mm-hmm. um, and your next steps. Catherine, what are you looking forward to in the immediate future? I always get asked this question, like whether that's my year-end review, you know, what's next? <laughs> and I never have a good answer. I really mm-hmm. don't. But I think throughout the years, what I've been able to do is just keep an open mind and be aware of the opportunities that are out there and what's happening and being a part of that conversation. And then it's always led to something else. Um, Trusting my gut, it's always led to something good. So I don't honestly know what's out there. Um, You know, we're, we're growing our team and I enjoy working and collaborating with new members who bring so much to the table. And I feel like I'm constantly learning from them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the future where we're growing and we're learning. That's, that's really what I'm looking forward to. That's brilliant. Continue to learn and grow, Catherine. Catherine, is there any part of your life or career or is there anything else that you missed that you would like to share before we close the podcast in the last minute? I don't think so. I know there's going to be other things later on. Like I said, when I hear this, I'll be like, "Mm, why didn't you say this? Why didn't you say that? But again, that goes back (laughs) to being too hard on yourself and I'm working on it. (laughs) That's great, Catherine. Don't worry. I think uh, that's brilliant. So thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us, especially from your office, because this is the first office recording for us, I think. So it's a privilege. I feel so special. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's an absolute privilege and a pleasure to have you here with us at Scribble Talk. Wish you and your family and everybody at your work and your neighborhood and anybody whom you touch all the good health and happiness. 
Continue to inspire Bitten Propose the colleagues and everybody around you, Catherine. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay sane, and lots of love to you and your family. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. This was really a fun time, and um, I'm going to look forward to listening to this. I might cringe a little bit at my responses, but I, I'm excited <laughs> to hear it. Thank you so much for, for having me on. Thank you, Catherine. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays, Pascal Sindrum, signing off.